So the Swedish president believes that it is necessary to speed up transition so that the EU leads the way in a green transition. Uh, I'm glad that the Swedish presidency requested this opinion, not only me, but uh, because it is a very important topic for the development and cohesion of the EU, but uh, also for the reduction of inequality. Uh, preparing this explanatory opinion was certainly not an easy task, uh, given its wide spectrum, which covers the areas like infrastructure as a prerequisite to a transition till different modes of travel, energy and fuel, but also uh, three dimensions of sustainable development, economic, environmental and social. Uh, I was the president of the study group that worked on the opinion that was adopted uh, in last uh, month in uh, our plenary at the European Economic and Social uh, Committee, and I will moderate this webinar. Uh, first, we shall hear from uh, my colleague Stefan Bach, uh, who was rapporteur, and Mateusz Szymanski, co-rapporteur. Uh, they will present this opinion uh, briefly and uh, with particular attention to the social dimension of the future mobility. In the second part, attention will be put uh, to sustainable urban mobility because our network is dealing with uh, uh, that issue. Uh, Pedro Homem de Gouea from Polis Network will talk about uh, how not to transform urban mobility and warn us of lessons learned from European front runners in urban mobility. And uh, last speaker uh, is Tim Aspergis, who is coming from Belgian city of Leven. He will uh, present their good example of planning and implementing measures for better quality and greener uh, mobility in their town. And uh, we really have uh, can hear a lot of uh, inspirational stories from uh, that, uh, that town. Uh, this is uh, followed by a short discussion with the participants. You uh, will be able to post the uh, questions uh, and uh, comment and uh, at the end uh, we shall hear a short closing remarks uh, given by our uh, speakers. So uh, um, I greet uh, again all our speakers and uh, I will give the floor first to Stefan Bach, who was a uh, rapporteur for the uh, for the this opinion and uh, just briefly a few words about Stefan Bach, who is the director uh, of EU and sustainable transport uh, within Confederation of Swedish Transport, e transport Enterprises, responsible for infrastructure, climate and energy uh, issues. Uh, Stefan has uh, close to 40 years of experience in transport policy and has held several positions in the Ministry of Transport in Sweden, as well as the General Secretary in Swedish International Freight Associations. Uh, he's a member of European Economic and Social Committee since uh, 2010, and he has been reporter on uh, many uh, important transport and climate-related opinions, including uh, this one, which is uh, uh, the actually the title of our webinar, Transition to a Long-Term Sustainable Transport uh, System. And uh, maybe I, sh I should tell before uh, a few words about the European Economic and Social Committee, so I will use the opportunity now. It's uh, official uh, consultative body of uh, EU Commission, Parliament and Council, and uh, we consist of three groups, uh, which are uh, Association of Employers, Employees and uh, uh, other various interests, including uh, associations uh, and uh, uh, that are dealing with transport, climate, uh, environment, sustainable development, consumers, etc. So not taking much more time, uh, Stefan, the floor is yours. Uh, my colleague uh, uh, Magdalena will share the 
uh, your presentation. Okay. I, okay, hope you can hear me and thank you for the, the, yes. the uh, 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 invitation and for your uh, presentation. Um, yes, I, I was rapporteur of this uh, uh, opinion and uh, it is uh, uh, of course a very, uh, very broad issue. Um, so it was, uh, as you, you stated, we, we, we had to, to focus on, on some overarching things instead of getting into detail, which we could have done uh, a lot if we, we had a, a possibility to that. Um, yes, and, and um, can you put the next picture in? Um, the EU has for, for some time now aspired to take the lead in the green transition, including transport, aiming at climate neutrality 2050 with the Fit for 55 pa package as a significant step to get there through making 55% reduction of carbon dioxide emissions by 2030 illegal obligation. Uh, the trilogues for, for this Fit for 55 package have, are advancing well, and most recently the agreement on the amendment to the emission trading system, ETS, which includes now road transport, maritime transport and aviation, as well as uh, refuel, aviation, uh, etc., cetera, were, uh, has just been reached in trilogue. Uh, these agreements clearly demonstrate a high ambition level to decarbonize transport, just as does uh, the also re uh, adapted rules on carbon dioxide emission levels for cars and vans, and the recently submitted proposal for strengthened rules on carbon dioxide emissions for heavy duty vehicles. <clears throat> on all these points, you, you can see that EU demonstrates that it is capable of wielding a stick um, because many of these regulations are, are, are the strictest worldwide. Um, but you can also see that there are some, some problems taken together the ETS, the fuels and the carbon dioxide regulation mean a cost increase. Um, although not directly uh, 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 linked to today's topic, uh, 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 another recent example of what I'm talking about is the current production of sustainable aviation fuels worldwide, which is right now about 25 million tons, but the needs for aviation by 2030 under the new rules now agreed will be 350 or 450 million tons. Um, and uh, these fuels are also about four times as costly as the now used kerosene. According to the Airlines Association, A4E, uh, the cost of sustainable aviation fuels would amount 20 billion euros in 2030. In concrete terms, this might risk reduced competitiveness for European airlines and increased ticket prices and freight costs. This is just an example of a recent example of, of the problems we, we see and the situation in, in the US under the Inflation Reduction Act is a bit different be, simply because financing is there to promote fuel production and to provide support to airlines and reduce extra costs. So such carrots and support initiatives, they are considered by the commission, but with very lim inadequate resources, unfortunately. And this brings me to the just adopted EEC opinion on the green transition of transport. Uh, as, as already mentioned, it was requested by the Swedish presidency as an exploratory opinion. Uh, and uh, uh, against this background of the objectives of the Green Deal. Um, in the, this opinion, the ESC defines what we consider as essential elements for the Green Deal to be a success and avoid that it remains a dead letter. I think you could change to the next uh, one. Oh, okay. You have already done that. That's okay. <laughs> Keep it, yeah. Um, it is... Um, 
By way of general comments, we, we first point out that transport covers a large number of issues, many of them specific for each, each transport mode, but, but essential elements for implementing and appropriate as appropriate speeding up the transition of transport are basically emission reduction, uh, development of renewables, digitalization, improved efficiency, and alternative means of transport, especially in city mobility, which we'll come back to today. These elements and the availability of adequate infrastructure for fuels appear to be common for all uh, modes uh, and both goods and passenger transport. It is important that uh, adequate resources private and public are provided for research and development of zero and low emission vehicles, renewable fuels and digital solutions for transport. It is, all, it is important that all relevant legislation should as far as possible be consistent with the objectives of the green transition and promote the reduction of emissions. Uh, since Transport demand 2050 is expected to be twice that of today. A good and credible management of the transition becomes essential uh, with the implementation measures that are both seen as feasible and uh, that the right signals go out to the market. Uh, we point out the need to pay attention to the important social effects of transforming transport both for the workforce and users. We will come back to the with my co-rapporteur. This means making sure that never negative effects on workers are avoided, uh, that avoidable affordable transport is available to users, and that logistic chains are efficient and reasonably priced. It takes to get the acceptance of, of the workforce, the general public and uh, uh, business. It takes this. Um, so credibility is also essential for, for people to be ready to modify habits and lifestyle to promote transition. For instance, buying zero or low emission vehicles, using car, car sharing, public transport, or active means of mobility, such as cycling and walking. In a 27 member states EU, where elements such as nature, demography, uh, population density, general living condition, and cost level of businesses vary considerably. It may be necessary for uh, practical and feasibility reasons to accept that one size does not necessarily fit all, and that it might be necessary to be flexible and accept different solutions to the extent that these do not disturb the functioning of the internal market. But examples of this could be rules of the size of vehicles or the extent of uh, forestry products uh, could be used in biofuels and indeed the overall possibility to use such fuels. Especially technological neutrality um, should be an overarching principle uh, because uh, when conceiving and implementing solutions at EU and national level, this should be an overarching principle to make it possible to take account of national conditions. The European Commission focusing very much on electricity in transport produced from renewables and green hydrogen as mean the main energy sources for green mobility. Still, for instance, the proposal for carbon dioxide emissions limitation for heavy duty vehicles brings up the possible limitation for electric propulsion, in particular for long distance transport, as, uh, as well as the question of the adequacy of supply of alternative fuels uh, for such vehicles and their total cost of ownership. In this context, the automotive industry has suggested an alternative option to develop low carbon fossil fuels uh, as a transitional practical means of bring down uh, emissions without requiring fleet renewable and uh, renewable and dedicated infrastructure. We suggest a development of both options to optimize results. 
We also recommend a more comprehensive method of assessing the carbon dioxide emissions of vehicles, uh, replacing the current tank to wheel method with the well to wheel method, which provides a better basis for the carbon uh, dioxide emission assessment. Efficiency proves, uh, improves transport sustainability and may be achieved through better loading capacity, improved infrastructure that make transport quicker, uh, it, uh, improved terminal infrastructure, uh, and new technology and new ways of using means of transport, for instance, uh, through car sharing, uh, may reduce in particular urban traffic volumes possibility to use these facilities that improve efficiency should not be conditions on, for instance, the environmental qualities of a vehicle, since that might limit the scope of the relevant improved sustainability. I guess I, I have to speed up. Uh, uh, clearly, digitalization is a further means to improve efficiency. Uh, yeah. Uh, Take your time, Stefan. Yes, yes, I'll, I'll, I'll try to, to sum up. Um, yes, digitalization is a further means of improved efficiency. And uh, multimodality is also something to promote a seamless uh, change between the modes. Um, but it also, we should also use optimal use of solutions that are available uh, in, in, in the transition. Um, and financially credible solutions. I, I skip a little bit about the social dialogue because I think my co-rapporteur will come back to that and say that uh, we can take the next uh, or the one before maybe. Yeah, because this is the three main conditions in our opinion for success with, the tra with this uh, transition to green transport system. First, businesses must feel that they are not burdened with excessive costs and that they, where they will remain competitive, both inside and outside the EU. The employees must experience the transition as acceptable and be given a real possibility to adapt to new working condition and a social acceptable manner. And the third, citizens, both in agglomerations and rural areas must be granted accessibility and mobility as a reasonable cost. Uh, so maybe the next slide, just to say something about, we have, a, I've already mentioned the tools we have to, our, uh, to use this. And we think that focus should be on the best way of getting results uh, with less emphasis on encouragement and more, more emphasis on encouragement uh, and less on restrictions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Stefan. Uh, I have to mention that uh, uh, with uh, together with the short report uh, of this webinar that we will put on our websites and informal participants, we shall put the link to our uh, opinion as well. So everybody uh, will have a chance to read it in more detail because it's not uh, enough time to say everything. But uh, now I would like to give uh, the word to Mateo Szymanski, who was a co-rapporteur, and just uh, uh, to briefly uh, introduce Mateusz. Uh, Mateusz is, uh, sorry, <laughs> he is expert of the Polish Trade Union Solidarność, uh, and in the past he was responsible for the coordination of tripartite social dialogue, and currently heads the work of the for in office. He is member of the uh, European Economic and Social Committee since 2020, but uh, very uh, active in different sections like uh, transport, energy, infrastructure, and the information society and the external relations uh, sections, uh, where he deals in Teralia with transport issues. As I mentioned, he was a co-rapporteur on opinion on this opinion, but uh, last year uh, during uh, one of the CVNET events, we had a chance to uh, hear uh, his presentation on 
uh, opinion uh, from our committee related to sustainable and uh, smart uh, mobility strategy. So, Mateusz, the floor is yours. You will talk a little bit more about social aspect uh, of uh, future uh, mobility. So, please take the floor. Thank you, Lydia. Before I, I uh, share my screen to show the presentation, I'd like to thank you for the invitation. Uh, yes, it's become kind of a, a tradition next year. Uh, I mean, this is the second year when I join a, such an event organized by you, Lydia, so thanks a lot. Um, I'm very happy. We still have something to discuss on such uh, occasions as we had last year, the urban mobility framework. Now we have this uh, opinion uh, which we worked on with Mr. Buck. Uh, we'll see what uh, future brings. However, I'm sure that it will bring as uh, this transportation uh, is still something uh, ongoing. Uh, there are more and more discussions about how it, it can transform. Uh, and then, the, of course, uh, different aspects, uh, ways of transportation uh, and, and dimensions could be uh, under our consideration. Uh, today, I will uh, present uh, some considerations, some some thoughts on social dimension of the future mobility. I hope you can see the uh, the, the presentation um, I have on the screen now. Um, of course, uh, the reason for this meeting is our recent uh, opinion on uh, the transformation, which was uh, requested by the Swedish presidency. However, in this opinion, I tried to uh, to gather some thoughts, ideas, uh, points from other different uh, different opinions to give you more broader picture of what the ESC and, and its members thinks about the social dimension of the future mobility. Um, Unfortunately, I'm afraid I will somehow uh, be repetitive to what Mr. Buck said already. Uh, it's not easy to make a clear distinction between the uh, different aspects and dimensions of, of what is transport and then uh, what can, uh, you know, what, what kind of aspects we could find in it. Uh, however, I hope uh, it will not be uh, boring. If we look at the ESC, 10 section web page, uh, which is uh, somehow, of, of course, related to transport and some goals related to social goals, you will find two of them. The first is uh, that uh, we, we want to achieve a situation when we uh, successfully tackle congestion uh, and uh, we provide access to all, especially older people and uh, the desirable people. The second point is to be sure that all are in all are on board and all take part in the decision making process. So it's in, about involvement and participatory um, way of planning what can be the future uh, transportation. Uh, in this in this very broad, uh, you know, overarching mindset. We work quite a lot, as I said already, and um, there we have four recent opinions uh, from this and the last year on transportation. Not all, but I think these are the most uh, important when we think about the social dimension. Uh, so we see an um, opinion on intelligent transport systems. We have EU urban mobility framework. We have uh, importance of public transport for Europe's green recovery and this is the own initiative opinion and also we have this last one on a long-term sustainable transport system which has been um, more detail in a more detailed way presented by by Mr. Buck. As Mr. Buck already said and unfortunately uh, these are there was the risk that we will be sometimes uh, a little bit uh, more repetitive uh, all the prospects for transport and it, when we look to papers reports which are trying to forecast what uh, will be the future transport uh, shows clearly that uh, it will the demand for transport will grow of course estimations could differ a little bit but in general as, as mr buck said uh, demand will be more than double and we have many many reasons for that it's urbanization it's um, regional intercity travel um, it's uh, economical development and so on and so on. So in general, we need more transport in the future. 
and we need to transform it. When we look at the regulatory framework in the EU level, uh, we had a lot of um, decisions taken in, in, uh, in um, last years, uh, but also months and even weeks. So we have this part of the Fit for 55 package uh, about the ETS. Um, it's also about the alternative fuel infrastructure. We have a revision of the Trans-European trans Transport Network. Last year we had the mobility framework, uh, urban mobility framework. But also what is important for me uh, to, to still remember is that we, uh, when we think about the social uh, dimension, we need to think about also a more political um, way of doing things. And one of it is the European Pillar of Social Rights, which uh, positioning transport as one of the main basic essential rights of uh, European citizens. So it's important to still be aware of it. And then we can think about mobility as a right as a, and as a public good. Then we, we need to put an emphasis on it and then work on it, not leaving it to only, I don't know, market uh, powers. Uh, when, when thought about, um, uh, when thinking about the social dimension, of course, there, there could be many, many different aspects. Uh, we can look on it from different um, uh, sites. But I found more like priorities or themes which we can find in our positions, opinions of the ESC on the social dimension, which is the balance, accessibility, adaptability, and uh, the way we create uh, policies, the way we plan the process. And in regard to balance, uh, as already Mr. Buck mentioned, it, is about how we we are like we, we are in a moment when we have uh, main three challenges. That's that's what I think. It's one of the is, is how we care of the environment, yeah, climate climate change, and then we have um, uh, the, the situation where we try to be sure that people are on board that they have access. So we, there is this uh, social sphere. The third is uh, how we achieve uh, the competitiveness yeah? so, because it's, it's it's easy to be uh, competitive without environment and social but also it could be uh, we, we can of course achieve uh, ecological goals forgetting about the social or competitiveness aspects so it's important to be balanced to, to think all all about these uh, three processes in parallel and uh, we, we have it in our opinions. That's, that, that's the way of thinking we, we want to have in our, in our work. Because if it does not happen, uh, there is a risk uh, of failure, but also of social unrest, which is uh, already proven when we look uh, on the situation where we, what, what, which we had in, in France with the yellow jackets. And in one of the, our meetings, colleagues from France um, uh, described this, uh, this process, how this social unrest has been uh, developed. And unfortunately, uh, one, one of the aspects taken into account was this social sphere of the way we want to achieve ecological goals. So it's important to be, to be uh, balanced. Um, and in one of our opinions, we said that uh, um, transforming uh, green transformation of the transportation shouldn't be a goal in itself, and I think this is this is absolutely important to to be to to, to be aware and think about how we want to transform uh, the system. Then we uh, have a, an aspect of accessibility. Uh, it's closely linked, of course, to the term of equality, uh, as as. When, when we think about transportation and rights to mobility, then of course we need to provide people with alternatives, with, to, to, with offers, yeah? uh, being sure that all who use uh, different modes of transport feel safe, um, they, they have an access at all uh, also, um, especially when we look at the situation between the rural areas and uh, agglomerations, sometimes it happens quite a lot, I can also speak on, on it uh, from a Polish perspective. Sometimes people from rural areas do not have access to the cities because there are no connections and so on and so on. So we, uh, it's a point which we discuss quite a lot in, in ESC. Uh, and, and, and 
in all our opinions I mentioned in the beginning, uh, we have this, this dimension. Also, when we discussed the urban mobility package um, uh, framework, um, it, it was the time of COVID. So we, thought, we saw clearly how uh, COVID and access to the public transportation, which, is, which has an absolutely crucial role in this system, um, was necessary, but also how safety, for example, was, was important uh, in, the, in the time. So uh, this is another point we, we can have on the list of what should be done to, to be sure that uh, transportation is socially friendly uh, and accessible. Uh, yes, and this public transport plays a special role, as I said. Uh, and uh, fortunately, fortunately, you, you sees it, uh, seeing that as a, as a way to achieve um, more green uh, Europe, more green transport. Um, there are quite a lot of ambitions how we should develop public transport. However, we need to be sure that aware that mostly these are the uh, member states who has the responsibility and the uh, powers to develop public transport, not even member states, but, but local governments, uh, local authorities play the, the main role. That's why, uh, and I will talk a little bit later on this, um, our involvement is, is absolutely necessary to be sure that, um, this, that we develop public transport in a way that is socially friendly. Uh, also, one, one, one thing uh, is, is necessary uh, for, for me, as, 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 as Lydia said, I'm a trade unionist, the, the question of how we price public transport is, is absolutely crucial because, of course, prices for public transport can be low, but then uh, we cannot um, provide uh, workers in, in this sector with um, decent remuneration, decent sa salary. Then the question of what is a fair price for transport uh, needs to be answered, and it's not an easy uh, question to answer. Uh, however, this is also a goal we, we, we need to think about when thinking about uh, how we want to organize public transport. Then the third, uh, third point is adaptability uh, or flexibility. Um, what I am thinking uh, here is that, uh, first of all, uh, adaptability means also that we as a consumers, we as workers in the sector, we as um, providers, we need to adapt, of course. Um, then awareness raising that we need a transformation is a first step. Uh, also make people aware, make people open to modify their habits also is important. Um, but we can look on it from a different point of view. And then we, we, we have this question of, um, of what Mr. Buck already said a little bit on is that uh, all all size fits, I mean, sorry, one solution fits all. No, uh, there are different um, backgrounds, different situations, different economical um, conditions in, in each city, even region of Europe. So we need to take into account these, these differences um, to be sure that um, we provide uh, solutions which are feasible and credible. Uh, and also somehow enhance market to adapt in a way we want to achieve in, in, in the future. And then we go into maybe even the most important point of this presentation, which is the way we create policies, how we process the, the, the planning of uh, what transportation we want to achieve in our cities, in our countries, in the EU in general. And then we have a uh, very important uh, uh, goals of, of consultation, social dialogue. Um, in, in the urban mobility framework, we discussed quite a lot um, documents like sustainable urban mobility plans, sustainable urban logistic plans. Uh, as, as you see, this, this, um, this collective work on, on, on transportation, on the way we want to transform this um, uh, mobility uh, is absolutely important because then we we are sure that people are aware that they that their opinion is taken into account that they can even vocal their 
they are may, maybe maybe fierce about um, the, the future transportation. So this is this is absolutely important. Also, the social dialogue dimension, collective bargaining. When we want to achieve the situation when also workers are open to change, uh, without them is, in my opinion, impossible uh, to do it. Um, so, so it's important to have it into our minds, and it must be very clearly seen uh, in all the process. Uh, I have also here a point on international cooperation and uh, networks, and I think it's important. As you see, we are in this uh, CVNet framework today, and um, it clearly shows that exchange of information, exchange of uh, thoughts, ideas uh, can play a main major role in how we transform um, transportation in the EU. And in this regard, as I said, there are, you know, different uh, perspectives, perspective of a consumer, provider, but also worker. Uh, it's impossible to, to avoid these uh, uh, considerations here. So we see in the EU that we have labor shortages. Um, there are many estimations, but this number is quite high in the all EU. Uh, honestly and simply, people do not want to work in, in the transport. Um, working conditions are not always um, best. Um, it's a difficult job, of course. Um, so the question is whether we'll be able to provide the system, the sector, with uh, enough workers, enough people. So then the question of working conditions is one of the first to, to, to answer. And the way to achieve um, consensus in this regard between the workers and employers uh, can be, as I said already, uh, social dialogue and collective bargaining, uh, because then we have both sides at the table uh, agreeing for some specific uh, conditions of, of work, of organizing the transport in our cities, but also in the economy in general. Um, and in regard to, to workers and employment, um, of course, when we discuss transformation, we need to think about the future uh, future um, uh, competences. And then, uh, of course, we, we must think about how we provide people with training, lifelong training, as this is a prerequisite uh, of, of the transformation. We, we need to be sure that people know, people know um, how to use new tools, even digital tools, which has been already mentioned by Mr. Buck, um, uh, because without that, uh, it could be a, very difficult to, to transform and then we lose competitiveness. So it's intertwined as you, as you see. So thanks a lot. Uh, it's, it was just a brief uh, view on uh, on, on the social dimension, I hope I at least, uh, you know, give you a little bit of information from the ESC on the, in this regard. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Matos. Uh, yeah, it uh, gives a, a brief uh, view of uh, what we think uh, in European Economic and Social Committee. You mentioned some uh, some opinions. We shall put link uh, on them uh, as well. And just to uh, wrap up this, uh, uh, this part of our webinar related to our opinion on future of uh, uh, transition to sustainable uh, transport system, uh, as uh, Stefan mentioned, the transition to a long-term uh, sustainable transport system must be implemented in a way that citizens and businesses see as acceptable financially, socially, and in practice, and therefore be ready and willing to support it. Uh, and uh, our uh, two uh, uh, next speakers will, I think, uh, speak a little bit more uh, about that. But I just want to mention that uh, I am member of the group three of uh, the committee, and for me it is important that we recognize in the opinion the important role of civil society organization, including networks like civilness and other relevant stakeholders in awareness uh, raising. And uh, one thing uh, that was mentioned uh, 
in our opinion is that uh, basic approach should be making optimal use of solutions that are available and working. So besides developing new and innovative solution, which is absolutely needed, it is equally important not to hamper the use of options already uh, available. So uh, in regards to our opinion, I will stop uh, here. Later on, uh, participants could uh, pose the question or comment what uh, they heard. But now in the second part of our webinar, we shall be more uh, focus on concrete uh, recommendations, but also we shall see concrete uh, uh, strategies, uh, measures, and uh, how uh, Levin implemented uh, uh, di different ideas and uh, actually became a front runner city in many aspects. But before that, uh, Pedro Homem de Guevia, I hope I... <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, we'll uh, give an interesting uh, uh, presentation uh, how not to transform uh, urban mobility and we shall hear lessons learned from different uh, towns uh, which are actually European front runners. So Pedro, uh, uh, before I give you the floor, just a few uh, words uh, about you so that uh, people know from where you come. So you are a senior policy and project manager at Polis. Uh, I think uh, most of our participant, uh, no, participants know that uh, Polis is a leading network of European cities and regions committed to transport innovation. And you coordinate the working groups for governance and integration and for road safety and security. Uh, you are an architect uh, by profession with extensive experience in urban governance, public participation, strategic planning, public uh, space, but also inquiry for design. So different service focus groups, structure observation, etc. And uh, it's uh, good to know that you work more than 20 years at the local level as a strategist, designer, trainer, consultant, and political advisor. Uh, I would just mention city of Lisbon, where you develop and implement the pedestrian accessibility plan and kick uh, started the vision zero planning uh, process. So uh, with uh, your extensive experience, uh, let's hear what uh, would you like to recommend us. So the floor is yours, Pedro. Hi, Lydia, and hi, everybody who is watching this. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation uh, on behalf of the Police Network. Let me just start by saying that uh, uh, we really appreciate the presentations that were made by Stefan and Mateusz. Um, as a network of uh, cities and regions, uh, we strongly believe that to reach the goals of the Green Deal, um, it is in indispensable to accelerate the shift to sustainable urban mobility. And that obviously local and regional governments uh, hold the keys for many of the essential measures and decisions to make this happen and that happens as ma at many levels and for many purposes so it can go from who uh, can improve road safety so that people feel encouraged to walk who can uh, rather who can grow exponentially the uh, the length and the uh, reach of the uh, cycling networks who can improve public transport service etc 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 but also, in picking up on some of the issues that Stefan and Mateusz said, I mentioned, uh, there are also uh, regional governments uh, working hard across the European Union to deal with the very challenging issue of the transition in automotive regions, because there is an industry and a large economy uh, and jobs uh, supporting these uh, mobility options for, for a century now. Uh, and that transition that also means it's not just about mobility, it's also about jobs, it's also about industry, it's also about the economy, obviously, that regions can play a critical role. And some of our members are working hard in that domain. It's also a question for labor, because at the same time, we see digitalization and automation happening. It's not just about 
making things more sustainable. It's also about introducing very fast, very different, uh, radically different technologies into the mobility sector. And that necessarily has an impact on the transport workforce. And so we are also working on that. And that's another issue where we could should highlight also the important role that cities and regions have to play and that many of them are already playing. Um, now, the rest of the presentation, um, I will look a bit about like an extraterrestrial, but that's because of Lydia. Uh, thank you for provoking me. Um, let me just share my uh, screen here for a second. I'll be, <clears throat> sorry, you can see the slide, right? Yes, okay. So um, Lydia challenged me to say how not to transform urban mobility and some of the hard, painful lessons that have been learned by some of the uh, European uh, front runners in this domain. So, <clears throat> so it's 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 really um, you've mentioned polis. So I I would just like to say that we have over a hundred members from all across Europe. So these these lessons I'm not going to mention who did what. But uh, these lessons come from many of these members. We are working with technical practitioners, but we are also working with the political officials. And that's very important because they are very different actors in this play. Um, they, uh, many of them are, and we should really understand that because they are called to make critical decisions. Um, they don't have to have a specific training uh, on the transport uh, field. Um, they have a very steep learning curve. They have to come in and they have to start changing things uh, in four years and reach concrete uh, results in four years. So it's really challenging. Uh, and they obviously must be supported if we want change to happen. But as we'll see, there's more than that. So the challenge that we face is not really changing sustainable urban mobility or promoting the change in sustainable urban mobility is really accelerating the shift to sustainable mobility in making it happen at such a speed and such a scale that we often don't really think of it. And obviously, acceleration can be scary because it means changing things a lot and very fast. And so while we need to accelerate things, we need to be careful not to crash the car, the bike, or whatever transport mode you like. And so it's at the same time making change happen fast, but making it happen in a sustainable way. And as you'll as, as I'll try to explain, that's actually uh, possible and in the most practical way to do it. It's not a dream. Now, one we one of the things that we often don't talk about when we talk about sustainable mobility is about the purpose. You know why? Because we all think it's very clear for everybody. And there are, you know, why do we spend time talking about let's just get going and doing things? <clears throat> well, you know, talking about let's just get going and doing things is the same thing as saying let's start on a journey. And it doesn't matter where we are. It doesn't matter where we want to go. Let's just start walking. That's obviously not the way we do it if we want to be to reach uh, goals. Um, and I think that probably the best lesson about the shift to sustainable mobility was given by Seneca, a Roman thinker from the uh, from over two thousand years ago, where he explained that if one does not know to which port one is sailing, meaning if you don't want if you don't know where you want to get no wind is favorable. If any of you has ever sailed a ship, we can even sail against the wind as long as we know where we want to go. And um, another thinker called Simon Sinek usually calls, talks about the start with why, meaning, you know, when we think about what we're doing, the why is the reason why we're doing it. The how is the strategy that we use to reach that goal. And the what are the specific measures and steps that we take to uh, follow that strategy. The problem is that we often, we often, especially in big organizations, we don't feel comfortable. And when we're pressed with time and when we don't really know things, uh, and we're when we're afraid of different opinions, um, we don't really spend enough time talking about the why, talking about the, the goal to where we want to get. And we jump immediately into discussing the what's 
So let's do bike lane. Let's do this. Let's do this. Oh, let's get autonomous vehicles. Oh, let's talk about data sharing. And the problem is that it is very, very, that's the quickest way to run against the wall. That's the quickest way to get into conflict with um, other people, either at the political level or at the technical level, because of the details. We have to start with the vision. We have to start with agreeing on the vision. And the big opportunity here is that when we talk about the future, and I mean, I can share with you that my personal experience in public participation shows it over and over again. When we talk about the future and when we think together about the future, it is much easier to build together a shared vision, to build agreement on where we want to get, and then to talk about how we're going to get there. But at least we agree on where we want to get. Agreements from then on are much, much easier. Not starting with, let's do this, let's do that, but let's discuss together what kind of common future we want to create for us, but also for our families, but also for our friends and neighbors. Um, it's, this is also the moment where we can bring into the discussion, you know, we've done, we're not just technicians or politicians. We're talking about the future, that the legacy that we want to live to our, to our kids, uh, to our grandchildren, to our nieces and, and nephews. And, um, and please note that the point here is not that, oh, we're going to do a shared space for cars and bikes and this and that, is that the, the common vision for the 20 years, for example, where they did this, uh, where they developed this common vision is that we want to have buildings in nature, that we want people to feel comfortable, that we want, we, we know we will need transport, but we want it to be peacefully integrated into the environment. And so now we know where we want to get. And from there, it's much easier to kind of start the discussion of the strategy. Another point is about leadership change and the scale and the speed of the changes that we need are so big that we really need leadership. Now, what kind of leadership? That's, I would say, the question. When we talk about leadership, we usually think of this, uh, one of my favorite paintings from uh, Jean de la Croix, La Liberté guidant le peuple, so freedom, liberty, guiding the people uh, and stepping on the fallen soldiers of the monarchy. The thing here is that we, we have this idea of brave, determined leadership, you know, leading the way. And everybody goes, um, um, and, and it's also very confrontational. Um, and obviously, I mean, that's one element of, of, of leadership. The point is that it shouldn't be the only aspect that we consider. Um, I think that one of the most interesting examples in the past few years is what happened actually in my city, in Lisbon, <clears throat> where where uh, the, the the mayor at the time, uh, who is actually the the, fir the the first one here in line during the campaign, uh, he was personally committed to um, promoting cycling in the city, as well. So was his deputy mayor, who was the second one in line in this picture, and he was very committed. And that's the kind of political will that we love to see in mayors and deputy mayors. The problem was, he didn't create the conditions for other politicians, particularly politicians in the opposition, to also ride the bike with him, to be a part of that change. He was very interested in, I, I, I believe it's by a tactical mistake, perhaps. It's not necessarily by, by being a bad person. I think he's a bad, good person. But the point is, he didn't, he wasn't careful to make, to build the broader coalition he thought, I'm going to leave in sustainable mobility. That's going to be my agenda. So I don't want to share this agenda with anybody else. Of course, he then launched this big uh, bike lane in one of the city's arterials, as with any uh, project that has such a big impact on mobility. Of course, it generates congestion. Of course, it has design problems, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This happens with any project. The problem was that because he was the only one pushing for the project, when problems came, and they always come, he was alone. And all these problems, instead of being understood by his peers, by the opposition, as you know, it hurts to promote sustainable mobility, there was picked at rocks and thrown at him. And so when we discussed that he lost the elections because he did the bike lane, well, it's not, I wouldn't say that that would be the, the most important conclusion. It's that it's not a good idea to advance with these important changes 
without building a broad coalition. It doesn't mean that everybody has to agree with you on everything, uh, that you cannot advance while others don't let you. I mean, you're there to lead, but you need to build a broad coalition. That's, for example, one of the what happened in, in, in Ghent, um, where uh, Deputy Mayor Philippe Watu uh, pursued from, for a few years uh, this new scheme of circulation. He even got death threats, but he was able to connect with um, deputy mayor, with the city councillors that were in the opposition, and he was able to communicate with them and to build cooperation so that he could advance with this scheme. Another point is about compromise. We think that, oh, so building a broad coalition means you have to negotiate, and negotiate means compromise, means, you know, you kind of look for the middle point. That's not a good idea either. <clears throat> No, I mean, not always, because the point is with sustainable mobility, you really have to drink the full cup. Because if you don't, and it's the same thing with sustainable mobility and with road safety, you can't be half sustainable, you can't be half safe. For the measures that you implement to be effective, to have a positive impact, you have to implement them fully. And if you just go half the way, you will not have the benefits and you will have all the problems. So actually, the safest thing to do is to go all the way in implementing these sustainable mobility measures. And it's tricky to really see how you know, these compromises often pop up. For example, you know, a very common example is we, we, we must ensure that the cars have their space and then we provide a space for the pedestrians on the sides. But I mean, is this a walking friendly environment? Or we will put bike lanes. I mean, of course, we don't have optimal conditions to put bike lanes, but it's still better to put the bike lane than to put nothing. And then we get this kind of things. Whereas a very interesting example is, for example, is uh, the case of Brussels, where they are reducing the speed, the speed limit across the whole city the streets that you see in yellow are the arterials where the speed limit will remain at 50. And the ones that you see in light blue, those are the streets where the speed limit is 30. And the point is, by reducing the speed limit across the whole network, you are able to make the whole network cyclable. So they are putting bike lanes in the streets where you that are marked yellow, where the higher speed limit you know, recommends a segregated bike lane. But in every other street, it's, it, you know, they, they just grew the bike lane by, I don't know, 500% by reducing the speed limit because the, 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 the city becomes cyclable. And that's, I think, the case with many cities where you cannot put bike lanes everywhere. You really need to reduce the speed limit to make people comfortable to cycle there in the middle of the cars. Now, that requires, again, a non, not the midway, but a clear compromise towards traffic calming and reducing the speed limits. Another word that usually comes up is, you know, courage. We need to be brave. Actually, when you talk to people and you ask them to be brave, it only raises the fear. And neurology, uh, neuroscience explains why, because it raises some the, the same hormones uh, that um, the same hormones that, uh, you know, you need to be brave are the same hormones that, uh, that, uh, that are generated by fear. So, you know, ask, people are afraid of change, consciously or subconsciously. So we have to be very careful with the way we use the courage. And also the other problem is that courage blinds us uh, to the fight. That's also the way we are wired. You know, we're like David looking for Goliath. And, you know, promoting sustainable mobility is going against the bad guys and the people who will use cars and they're against bikes and against pedestrians and this and that. It's not really that the case uh, in, in the lives of people. You know, many people are car dependent and that's what raises their resistance. And it also makes us miss what we call, you know, the easy wins. So you go, you don't start by winning the hard, by fighting the hardest fights. You start by winning the easiest fights or the places where there isn't going to even be a fight. I mean, who is against reducing speed limits and implementing traffic calming in front of schools, right? I mean, everybody loves children. Everybody thinks children should be safe. 
So actually, um, implementing traffic calming in front of schools, as Paris is doing, this is one of the examples. I mean, it's one of those cases where you, if you want to start change, you need to create a precedent. You need to get things moving. And that's not by making big changes that might. It's by creating precedent and implementing new things. And then they will multiply. Um, I think this is a very interesting uh, comment also. You know, you look for the way, for the easier way, like water. You know, uh, so um, a, Dutch, a Dutch vice mayor shared with us that um, they did a regional survey in a city uh, about the 30 kilometer per hour speed limit. You know, only 30% 30 30 of people were in, favor, were in favor of that limit. But when they asked people, well, would you like to reduce the, the speed limit in your street? Three quarters were in favor of it. And the point here is not manip manipulating the question, it's actually asking the right question. Why would I ask you, Lydia, if you want to reduce the speed limit in your whole city? I mean, what legitimacy do you have to set the speed limit for streets where you don't live? Now, on the other hand, you are legitimate and you should be asked about what's the speed limit that you want on the street where you live. That is your habitat. It is your right. Another point is about power. Uh, we tend to think that, you know, we also call it political will often, that, you know, politician will come in and direct the people and direct the public and particularly direct the public officials and the public employees to go and do what I want. I mean, that's not how things go, certainly not uh, in a democratic country. Um, and we fail often to, we, we often think about the myth of political will and we fail to understand all the sources of resistance. Um, I mean, obviously, it's not that people don't want to respect the will of the elected officials, it's that things aren't that easy. You know, big organizations with lots of people, they all, it's, it, it's in the nature of the human being to hope that things will change without really having to change them, you know, by magic. Uh, or it's, it's natural for people to be afraid of innovation because innovation generates responsibility. I mean, if you're doing what everybody else has been doing all the time, something bad happens. I mean, it's not really your fault, right? You're just doing like everybody else. But you do so, if you do something different and something bad happens, then you're fully and only you are fully responsible for that. And people are naturally afraid of that. So that's another common problem in organizations. And finally, you know, also because um, so often managers get frustrated and political officials have to run for election again. There is a point, and I've lived this over and over, where you know things are so complex and so difficult, and so difficult, so much difficult that people will just start saying, "Okay, whatever we can do, you know, something that we can do fast." And that I think is one of the reasons why you see a lot of money being spent in road safety campaigns. You know, use your seatbelt, don't drink before you drive. You know, respect the pedestrians and all of that. Not because these campaigns are effective. I mean, science research has clearly demonstrated that they aren't. It's just because they show that we're doing something, even if that something isn't useful in the long term. So it's more of a sign of impotence than actually um, a concrete step. So we really have to, I won't be going to this into detail, but we really have to understand that it's not a question of political will. It's also a question of organizational capacity. And um, I'm going to skip because I don't think we have the time, Lydia. Um, just to say that, you know, there's also the question of, uh, we talk a lot about the paradigm shift, but we don't evaluate all the consequences of that paradigm shift. And we should look at history to really understand what happens when there is a paradigm shift. I think one of the most interesting examples as you've been washing your hands for the past three years is the case of this Hungarian-born doctor working in a Vienna hospital called Ignaz Semmelweis. At the time, um, in the mid 1800s, um, a lot of women uh, who uh, gave birth uh, in the hospital would later die of post-birth infections. And that's one of the reasons that many women gave birth at home because they were afraid of hospital infections. And why were these infections happening and how could you prevent them? 
And Ignaz Semmelweis, uh, uh, a doctor working in the maternity ward, was the one who found that if, if while going between patients, uh, doctors and nurses would wash their hands in a chlorine solution, they could almost bring to zero both postnatal uh, infections and deaths. And you'd expect that all these colleagues would pat him in the back and say, oh, well done, Ignaz, let's all start washing our hands. That's not what happened. The nurses did wash their hands, but all of these colleagues were very offended that he would tell them, a young doctor, not even an Austrian, that they would have to wash their hands, and they refused to do so. They, were, they persecuted him, they bullied him, he resigned from the hospital some time later. He ended up in a mental uh, institution with what we would probably call today a burnout, um, and died there because he was unable to understand why his colleagues would refuse a benefit from science. Um, it was one of the first clinical case trials in history. So it's about people are threatened by paradigm shifts. We could discuss this in more detail. There's no time. There's something else that we have to consider. And finally, just to shut up, Lydia, can I have two minutes? <clears throat> yeah, it's also a question of meaning. We often think that, you know, we, we, um, that we are thinking about the same things, and we're not. Every person has their own lives in their own reality, their own experience, their own values, their own expectations and attitudes, etc. And we have to understand <clears throat> that, you know, the over the past century, the automotive industry invested billions of dollars and euros in um, car advertising. And this investment was so massive and so well directed that the car um, isn't only that it shaped our cultural attitudes and expectations, not only about the car, but also about what is mobility, what is the mobility that we should want. Because the car is not a transport mode anymore. It is a cultural artifact. It is a symbol of power, of success, of status. Very importantly, it is a symbol of freedom. It is a symbol of virility. And so when we try to advance policies that will, you know, stop people from entering a part of the city. You know, that's kind of amputating part of their freedom of movement. Uh, if we, you know, imposing speed limits, you know, that's kind of reducing their castration, that there's, a, there's some castration element there. I'm not saying people say this explicitly or are conscious about it, but it's the way we have been primed and shaped to think about mobility. And of course, you only ride public transport if you're not successful enough to ride a car. And so we have to understand when we frame mobility policies that this is a big challenge that we have to deal with. Um, and we also have to understand that this frame keeps building our expectations about the mobility of the future. And that's why, you know, uh, everybody's so excited about the flying cars, everybody's so excited about autonomous vehicles, although they do bring some opportunities, but not the way they're being discussed. And finally, that's why everybody's so happy with the promise of electrification, because everything will be able to remain the same, but electric. And that's a challenge that we really have to take the opportunity to make electrification an opportunity to really change urban mobility. And we also have to find a positive message, encouraging messages, to, uh, to talk about shared uh, sustainable mobility. Very interesting example, just to close, is the case of Bilbao in Spain, where they decided to implement, uh, to reduce the speed limit to 30 kilometers per hour all across the city. And instead of saying, we're making things safer and we're reducing the speed limit so you cannot go, what they said was, we're making Bilbao 30 times safer. We're making Bilbao 30 times better. We're making Bilbao 30 times uh, friendlier. And that's, you know, what really made them uh, push forward. I hope I didn't take too much time. Uh, I will be sending some elements to, um, to Lydia uh, after this meeting that she could share with the participants. Thanks a lot for the opportunity once more. Thank you very much, uh, Pedro. Many situations are very familiar. Uh, with uh, to all of us who work in planning and urban planning uh, uh, and uh, visioning and so on, uh, I think we could uh, develop uh, 
good discussion about those issues maybe ne next time but uh, i think you uh, gave a uh, food for thought for, to our participants how maybe to approach differently in their uh, in their uh, towns and uh, now uh, we shall hear how we should work uh, and how uh, front runners are doing in Europe and uh, with us is Tim Asperges from City of Leven and uh, I would like to thank, thank, him, thank him especially because he is at Velo City so he find uh, time to join us to uh, this webinar and Tim, sorry, but I have to say that you were cycling four days to Velo City. It's, I'm still, still really <laughs> uh, impressed with that. So uh, before uh, giving you the floor, just a brief uh, words about you. You work as expert advisor on uh, mobility policy at City of Lev Leven, and you are uh, urban planner with expertise in urban mobility for more than 20 years. And since 2014, you are working as, uh, as expert advisor for the City of Leven, although you have uh, uh, quite a career before that, uh, you were director of consultancy uh, Timenko and uh, work uh, as a researcher lecturer for the different institutes and you are still uh, doing, doing that. And uh, uh, I think you will mention uh, the, uh, what uh, City of Leven uh, is doing uh, within Polis and uh, uh, about uh, hosting Polis conference. I will not uh, work, uh, talk about that. And uh, uh, I would uh, just finish that uh, saying that uh, in your presentation, he will explain the role of local government as market master of the public domain and uh, its guidance to sustainable transport. So, uh, Tim, the floor is yours. Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, also, thanks for the invitation and uh, also thank you for the, the different speakers for the, yeah, that also already introduced what I am going to talk about. What I would like to show uh, to the participants is uh, indeed uh, the why, the how, the what, but especially also the who. Uh, also the question for who we are doing these kind of measures. And uh, in the presentation which I give, you will see a complete package of what kind of measures you can do in sustainable urban transport as a local government. And, uh, Important also a red line in my presentation is that uh, we are really yeah the space management and the combination of choosing for the right transport modes in an urban environment is is key element. But before I go into depth of what we are doing, uh, just short introduction: we are a mid-sized city of one hundred thousand inhabitants. Sp Special about Leuven is that besides the 100,000 inhabitants, we also have 65,000 students. So we, we are really university city. Uh, we are in the slipstream of the Brussels capital region. So we, uh, we are 20 kilometers east of Brussels. But what is clear in Leuven is that on the level of the city, we already have a very high model model split in sustainable transport modes. I will show it in a, in a minute. At this moment, the city of Leuven is also selected as one of the 100 mission cities. It are uh, cities that should become or should be the front, front runners in becoming climate neutral cities by 2030. And of course, uh, urban transport is a key element in reaching that goal. Uh, at this moment, also the city of Leuven is president of the Polis Network, uh, like Pedro also already explained. And also for Leuven uh, being active in this uh, city and region network, it also gives ins insp inspiration to us. It also gives uh, also information to us to make our politicians take the right decisions. 
because every decision in urban mobility is a difficult decision. And we have to, to see how we are dealing with, with that. And all of you, end of this year, uh, 29th and 3rd of November, we are hosting the Polish conference. So if you want to see what I'm going to show, you are welcome in Leuven end of this year. Like many cities in Europe, Leuven is really facing the same problems. And what are these problems? We are a fast growing city, growing in inhabitants, growing in students, growing in jobs. And growing means more, tra more trips. And more trips means if you don't have a model sh shift, you will have congestion. And if we don't change in Leuven or if we don't change in other cities, we will be in, a, low, in a, a complete lockdown in many, many years. So that's the challenge also for Leuven. What I also show on this slide is when focusing on Leuven, we are not doing- Sorry, Tim, we yes. don't see your uh, presentation. Oh, so sorry. Yeah, um, you have to share it. Okay, then, uh... Yeah, I forgot to share it. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, no, it's fine. Scaring me. You have very nice presentation, so it's yeah. a pity not to show it. Yes. Uh, if you want, we can share it. As... No, it's okay. You can share yeah, no, it. I just forgot it. Uh, I was just... And I only see one screen here on my laptop. So, no problem. So, <laughs> so what is the positive element about this slide? is uh, you see that in the last 15 years, the amount of bus trips has multiplied by five. Also the amount of cycle trips, pedestrians. When you look to the city of Leuven, we are not doing bad. But when you see the number of car trips, 75% of the car trips that are on the field of the city of Leuven, are not caused by our inhabitants, but are caused by the region. So we really know that we can't solve our, our challenge regarding uh, model shift and, and accessibility without cooperating with our neighboring, neighboring municipalities, without cooperating in the region. And that's very important uh, uh, that we, we really cooperate uh, in the whole region of Leuven. And you see here, if, a uh, slide of the the east region, the, the yeah east of Brussels. It's the the Flemish Bra Brabant uh, province. It is important that we cooperate, especially on the urban developments and on uh, transport initiatives on a regional scale. We know where we have to go to to keep to to guarantee the accessibility of our city, but we can't do it alone. Other important element, and then I just go again to the level of the city of Leuven, it is that it is impossible to do it only as the city. And we have uh, already since more than 10 years founded an association, Leuven 2030. And Leuven 2030 is a non-profit association where the city of Leuven is a member, where the research institutes are members, where the companies are members and where inhabitants are members. And this quadruple helix, it's not theory in Leuven. Leuven 2030 is the organization who is looking for coalitions between the four partners which you see here. And at this moment, more than 600 research institutes, companies, inhabitants, city, are member of Leuven 2030. And to, to, to uh, be accepted as a member, you have to give an engagement what you are going to do to become a climate neutral city. And so in this cooperation model, we have a roadmap of what should be done on what time frame. But it is key that it is depending on every partner in that organization and that it is not only depending from the city. Regarding transport, we know where we have to go to. Uh, to to guarantee our accessibility in the future, we have to double the number of public transport trips and we have to double the number of bicycle trips. 
to uh, more or less balance the number of car trips. Regarding cycling, it won't be a problem. Eh? We will manage. Eh? And uh, we are also, and, and no, I skipped. And, and, and the other thing what I, which I was telling is you have to do it also on a regional scale. Uh, that's a Regionet project in Leuven, where we are cooperating with 33 municipalities around Leuven in urban planning and in transport planning. And it, it is this Vervoersregio Leuven where we are cooperating with each other. And what was I, I explaining regarding cycle trips? We will manage. Why we will manage? At this moment, we are already building the cycle infrastructure. There is really a political support to, to work on cycling. But regarding public transport, it is a, and, and you see here the cycle networks, also a lot of initiatives, not only on infrastructure, but also on traffic calming, on a cycle street, on a cycle zone. So it's not only about cycling infrastructure. Um, these are some cycle highways, which we are building or which have been built in the region. So that's also an issue. We also try to know where the cyclists are. So based on data, we also know where there are problems, where we have to focus or where we have to prioritize uh, some of the elements. Regarding public transport, it's an other issue. Like many cities, public transport is organized in a very uh, radial way with the, the main uh, station, many mid-sized cities I explained, main station, and all the trains go to the station and all the buses go to the station. But when you have such a network, it has limited capacity. And in Leuven, we can't accept any buses anymore at the bus at the one big bus station, Wielder railway station. So we have, we have to transform our public transport to um, an interchanging model with different transport hubs. And that's a much more difficult challenge. Also, the type of vehicle is a very big challenge. But at this moment, also in these regional scales, we have a vision how and why we are going to that new public transport network, which we are now readapting. And an uh, important in such a public transport network where you have to do interchanges is your clockwise uh, guarantee. So on the main access to our city center, we are uh, focusing on giving direct connections with public transport and giving also free bus la lines. And again, the problem is uh, lack of space. And, and just one example, which I show here, is an X towards the city of Leuven. Outside the center, you have a lot of space. You can choose to have two bus lines. But in the city center, you don't have the space. What we are doing here is doing a redesign of this environment, trying to work with one bus line, skipping all parking places so that you, so that you have also cycling infrastructure, and using one bus, bus line in, one, in, in both directions. And when you have a clockwise uh, guarantee, the buses will cross each other when they pass at a bus stop. Uh, and for organizing such a system, of course, traffic technology, traffic management is, a, is an important element. I will skip another project uh, to go some wider, but we are trying to build different transport modes or hubs in Leuven, where we also concentrate uh, urban development projects at these hubs. And last but not least, also the connection to hubs. We try to um, prepare also for autonomous vehicles. Autonomous driving on private uh, car use, it will happen. But autonomous driving in public transport, it should happen. And we try to also connect in projects where we could also use this kind of technology uh, in Leuven. This is such an autonomous vehicle which we are preparing to cross our city center. Um, then important in the approach of car accessibility is, of, is that we are bundling our traffic flows on the main road network. 
And everything what is white on this map, it are the car-free intermediate areas where we organize our, uh, our um, traffic circulation that cars can enter, but only people that should be there. If it's impossible um, to do it only with traffic circulation measures, we are going to look for help with technology. And here I show uh, in, in district where we had a lot of through traffic that shouldn't be there in that living neighborhood, but it was impossible to organize it only with traffic circulation measures. There we use NPR cameras where we have a white list of people that can cross uh, there, and it are the people that live there, and where there is, and the, 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 the cars that are not on the white list, they are going to pay if they cross uh, the NPR camera. Also important in our approach, and it's the issue of finding coalitions, of finding co-ownership, uh, is the citizens' engagement in Leuven. And we have a very simple and again, a technology driven uh, issue, but technology is not the main issue. It is the We Count project where we give sensors to a lot of inhabitants. Uh, uh, in Dutch, it is Tel Ram. Uh, so it's, it's a counting sensor, a sensor that you put on your window, and the sensor is going to real, real time counting traffic, cars bicycles, uh, lorries, uh, vans. And this way, people are, uh, inhabitants are also collecting data on the, in the street about the traffic. And we can go into a more neutral or objective discussion about, is there a problem in your street or not? And do we have to solve your problem first, or are there other bigger problems in your neighborhood or in the city? We also use these data, and it, it's our open data. Everybody can look for these figures. And also the city is using these kind of data to do our traffic modeling and to prepare our mobility plans. Regarding parking, there's a clear vision that we have parking facilities for our visitors. Uh, suburban parking, peripheral parking, center parking, and last but not least, parking on the street. But at, uh, at the long term, the idea is that you, we are phasing out on-street parking for visitors. When we go look to our inhabitants, we know that we have 100, no, but we know that we have 1,000 inhabitants extra every year. So you have to explain to your inhabitants that it is impossible to offer on-street parking for everybody. So first uh, approach is simulating car sh uh, sharing to lower car ownership. And in the, in the last three years, uh, the, the last 20 years, also in Leuven, car ownership grow every year. And in the last three years, we have gone to a, a breaking point that every year car ownership is going down, not only in the city center, in whole of Leuven, all the city districts, car ownership is going down and car sharing is becoming more and more mainstream. So there is a quite huge amount of car sharing, then off-street parking on your own property, neighborhood parking, and last but not least, on-street parking if it is not uh, we, we give uh, residential residential cards. So just go quick to this car sharing or the 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 the, the uh, sharing mobility overall. So car sharing is going up every year. Also the electrification of car sharing uh, and regarding bike sharing, the city of Leuven is making very clear decisions that we no, that why we why we are going to implement bike sharing. Um, our vi our vision or our approach is that bicycle ownership is the key to more bicycle use. Uh, and we already have quite a, a high bicycle use. But if everybody who is, has now a, an own bicycle would use a shared bike, every bike sharing system is going to crash. 
So our approach is that we believe in bike sharing, but for certain targets, it's part of our public transport chain in the pre and after trip. And we foresee bike sharing systems for specific target groups, which I explain uh, later on. But main issue is to promote and to support bicycle ownership by offering bicycle parking facilities and, uh, and so on. So on the short distances, we really don't want that people are going to, you, to, to replace their own bike by a shared bike because we have really too many bicycle trips to cope with. On the long distance, there we want to give an alternative for the car by using public transport in combination with shared mobility services. So that's the approach in Leuven. And you have the, the, the uh, a bike sharing uh, at the main transport hubs, right? it's the blue bike called in Leuven. We have also a sharing system for children so that a family don't has to buy and own a, a new bicycle for that child if it's growing up. No, for 60 euro a year or 12 euro if you are a social group, you get a full option uh, children bike and you replace it when your child is grow, growing up. We have a buggy booker system in the city center, which means that young families, the children that can't cycle a long way, they don't, that, that we try to avoid that they take the, the car with the poussette in the car. No, we, they, they, we try to convince them to take the bicycle with the children behind and use a free buggy to uh, come to the city. Also other sharing systems like the, the swap bike and important on neighborhood level, level and why we offer cargo bike sharing and why we offer cargo bike sharing because that can be an alternative for your first or second car. Because car ownership, we want to lower it by offering shared cars and by offering shared cargo bikes. And at this moment, we have around 60, uh, at 50 locations, uh, 60 of these shared cargo bikes, and they are a huge success in Leuven. And then last but not least, and I'm not going to uh, generalize it for every city in Europe, but for Leuven, um, we have also a clear vision on the free floating aspect. And for Leuven, free floating, it is suggesting, so suggesting door to door. And there is only one transport mode who has, we can offer that can offer that service level and it's working. So on the really complete free floating, we are not fond of it. And I think more and more cities, but of course, we have organized some regulations the way our shared mobility uh, services, both bikes are, and cars, are organized in our public domain. And for that, we are clustering all these services on the so-called Mobi points, where we have an offer of shared car, shared cargo bike, uh, shared bike, and also on certain locations, also the parcel lockers on neighborhood level, and it's made very clear in the public domain that there is public space for that. And it is also clear that you can find your shared mobility services on these points. Also, the people in Leuven have been involved on detecting where you want these mobile points and what kind of services do you want on the mobile points. And so there are some clear regulations for all these mobility providers that can use our public domain in a regulated way. And here there's the opening of such a point with the minister. And also on that regional scale, we are implementing these different mobile points at this moment. And that's important to think in the future. That's my, my, my explanation. We are uh, changing from parking cities to pick up drop off cities. What do I mean by that? Um, car ownership is good going down, shared mobility services are going up. So we will we will win a lot of public space to do other things. 
And we, in the end, are going to code the curb where the public space will be used in a very flexible way. And uh, at this moment, it's just parking your car. But by using technology and uh, being more clever in, in the approach of your public space, you can have a diversity of services on your public space. And even in time, you could say at certain times you, the, the parking place is used for deliveries and at other times it is used for parking. Or, so by using these kind of um, flex curb management systems, which we are also preparing in Leuven, you can use your scare public space in a very flexible way. And that's also an important approach which we are doing in Leuven. I'm going to skip some of these elements. Uh, it's, it's also on the city logistic aspect where we are going to this uh, zero emission zone in the city center together with repost. And again, clustering uh, these uh, e-commerce packages on the different uh, delivery boxes uh, spread all over the neighborhoods. Um, and last but not least, uh, um, uh, we have been implementing a quite radical traffic circulation plan in the city center. And to make it happen, we really needed a strong coalition because it, it, it's always uh, a lot of uh, uh, opposition for such kind of plan. We need, um, and it's it's just a simple plan. Eh? Like every traffic circulation plan to avoid true car traffic, we have doubled our pedestrian zone, and around the pedestrian zone there is a traffic calming zone where only inhabitants can park on streets, but also no visitors are looking for a car parking. That pedestrian zone is controlled by an ANPR uh, camera system with delivery time, time frames and also with access regulations for certain uh, target groups. And it's also made very clear at what time of the day you have access and who has access. Uh, also, uh, in that plan, we have implemented a red, uh, quite big cycle zone, so 75% 75 of the city center has become a bicycle zone where the bicycles can use a complete street to uh, do the trips and cars have to stay behind. Why we have been doing that? We don't have the space in the city of Leuven to have a separate bicycle lane, a separate car lane. You have to share uh, these spaces and doing, in this uh, case, traffic calming. Uh, also, uh, different issues on cycling infrastructure. For the buses, we also agreed that they drive slower in the city center, even 20 kilometers an hour. But because of the traffic circulation plan, and despite that they have drive to drive slower, they are quicker to go through the center because traffic congestion has been solved. So it is a win-win for the cyclists, the pedestrians, and the buses. The buses go quicker, but they drive slower. Uh, also for the taxis, more uh, regulations. I'm going to also skip this. Uh, also on parking management, a lot of initiatives. And, of, um, and um, also um, in, in that balance of acceptance also with the shopkeepers. A lot of parking places have been replaced, but also to get to, to come to the city center to deliver something very shortly. We have installed shop and go parking places. People can come shortly in the city to pick something up or to bring something. And the shop and go parking places, you can park there for 45 minutes for free. And it is controlled by a sensor. And so the shop and goes are around that um, commercial heart of the city. And for residents, they can have a permission to park on the street, but they pay uh, for the first uh, thing, first permission, 60 euro, for first car, 60 euro a year. And for the second one, 300 euro a year. So also for in our inhabitants, 
we accept uh, that, the, that they use the street for on-street parking, but it isn't also for free. Uh, and then a lot of campaigns to make clear to everybody that such a plan has uh, the strength that Leuven stays accessible or is more accessible because there was a lot of uh, concern that people wouldn't come anymore to Leuven. Uh, on the logistic, I'm going to skip some elements because it's, but that it is important also specifically on, on city logistics that in the end we are going, we can use with, we can work with um, dynamic access rights where not only the eco score of your vehicle can be important, but also the loading degree, the products, if they are local or not. So you can give more or less access rights depending on how the, the, the vans are loaded or what type of products are coming in and out of your city. We have been experimenting with the, these dynamic access rights in a European project. It is tested, but it is not yet mainstream in Leuven, not at all. Another uh, project was this, and, and it's, it's again controlled by these ANPR cameras, who gets more or less access rights. And the same project, it's that flex curb management, where we guarantee to logistical services that they have a time slot and a place where they have a parking place. And it's again, with these digital tools that you can offer a place where they can deliver and where they have a free delivery zone at a certain time frame. It has been tested in Leuven. It is not mainstream yet. So it's again, it's our research projects on city logistics. But what I wanted to end with, to implement such a radical plan, you need, you need really a coalition. And that plan in Leuven, it wasn't the intention of the city council to do that plan in the beginning. It was not in the, in the political agreements, but we have this Leuven 2030 organization and they organize network events. And at a certain moment, there was a group of research institutes of companies and of inhabitants that asked, we want to have a traffic calming or car free city center. And they were so strong in forming that coalition that the city council understood, and especially our mayor understood, now it's the time to act. And in that perspective, it was not the, the mayor decided make the, the technical plan, go also in consultation with inhabitants, with schools, with companies, but we take something from them in the traffic circulation, which has a lot of negative impact, but also upgrade the quality of the public domain. And for, the, for that, we had three tracks, a track bottom up where people were involved to do small suggestions, temporarily uh, redesigns of streets because we couldn't uh, redesign the complete city uh, at the same time co-creation aspects where our city services were more involved in, in more complex projects. And then the very important city investments where we made a design and, and, and construction works to, to uh, um, change the public domain. And I give just some examples. So the, the, that, that, that is the, a bottom-up uh, approach. There was a square where cars are parked, but a lot of schools are around. And the schools suggested, we want to have a car-free square at the Damian plan. We hadn't the money to do the redesign, but we had the money to do temporarily street furniture and also guiding the schools, the inhabitants to make that decision. That was a bottom-up approach, which is looking like that now. It's temporarily, in the end, we will do the complete makeover of that square. Other example, uh, some squares where, again, temporarily uh, measures has been made. And also regarding the trees, in that plan, we wanted to have more trees in the city. 
but it was impossible to already do the, the, the design. So we had to work with these uh, concrete boxes. In the summertime, artists together with um, inhabitants and school have been uh, designing uh, own uh, uh, figures and did mosaics with all the children, the schools on all these boxes so that there is, so it, it looks like that. And that is really making co-ownership to implement such a plan. Uh, the, the boxes for trees have been done everywhere. So we have been starting now with uh, banks uh, to, to, to sit on. And the last are the big investments. There, it was important that we make a design and that we implement it very quickly. So in a time frame of three years, we made the design, uh, looked for a uh, uh, con construction works and, and, and did the complete makeover in real life. So there are different places where the public space really got an important upgrade in the city of Leuven. And that is important when you do such a traffic circulation plan that you have quite quick at the same time or just after it, also a, a strong upgrade of of your public domain so that people, inhabitants and shopkeepers really see that they get something in return. Um, and these are some pictures how it was, uh, I think 30 or 40 years ago. And then we had uh, the, the biggest roundabout was around the church in Leuven. And, and, and this is a figure in, and, and that what is what, what I want to know or what I want to end with. You really need also political leadership. And the, the picture which you see here is in 1979. And what is the picture about? It is the, op, the, the, the building of the first walking street in Belgium. And in 1979, the former mayor of Leuven was 33 years old, and for its first time in his career, he was an elder man. It's the guy here in front. On his 33, he managed to do the first walking street in Belgium in 1979. So at that moment, he already was a young political leader who had the guts to do such a plan. At the end of his political career, and he ended at 82 years old. He did, he did the, the finishing touch by doing the whole uh, makeover of the city center of Leuven by that traffic circulation plan. But what I mean is the mayor, you need also such kind of strong political leaders together with inhabitants, companies, with that broad coalition, you really can implement uh, quite radical um, urban mobility uh, aspects. That was my presentation. Wow, thank you, Tim. Uh, so I think we all know now why uh, you are a front runner. And uh, I have to say, Civinet uh, Networks have uh, had a meeting in Leven in January, and we saw a lot of these issues, but uh, we were not aware of everything that uh, you show us. So thank you for uh, this uh, presentation. Uh, so um, I would, uh, we, we have, let's say, five, six minutes more. So I would uh, ask our participants if they have uh, some question before we go to the uh, uh, final uh, sentence from our presenters. So uh, is there any question for the audience? Well, hi, one question. Sorry, obviously nobody ah, is yes. asking. Right? I will just uh, put my question on. A quick one. Uh, basically, very interesting uh, presentations. Thanks very much for uh, the time. My name is Goran, also a colleague from Odras. Uh, 
you uh, everybody mentioned especially in the beginning the need uh, to uh, involve uh, to do the changes uh, the problems that uh, might arise from not uh, developing the traffic uh, properly but obviously i think that most of us here in uh, our region so to say so region that is covered by seven at uh, slovenia croatia southeast europe is uh, that there are uh, social problems with people not accepting the uh, the changes could you maybe uh, Give us better example or some uh, some more examples on how to better control the complete process and to prevent the negative aspects because although it is necessary to change the way we travel uh and we, we are mobile uh, people do not accept it and really accept the changes very poorly we lately we had some uh, examples of not people not accepting uh, the changes in uh, in order to get uh, a sustainable urban mobility here in Zagreb as well. So uh, yeah, there is the need, but uh, I think some practical solutions will be okay for the cities. Thank you, Goran. So Tim, yes, please. Yeah, I, uh, Goran, I, I can explain um, because I have now the experience about how we did it with the plan in the city center and in this new legislature, which we are now, we are doing it in the city districts. And the approach in the city center was, then we had that, let's call old mayor, who had some, yeah, who really had really power, but he, he explained to us, or he asked to us, of course, I need public involvement, but I really also need speed in this, making the decisions and implementing it. So he asked to us, eh, we as a city administration and the whole team that had to prepare the plan, I really want that you focus the whole involvement of everybody who should be involved, that you focus it in one year. And then you get one year to implement it. If it is one second later, we don't do it. So that was the job that I had to do. I got one year to do the preparation and the consultation, and I got one year to implement it. Of course, in practice, it is a little bit more flexible, but it was a clear, uh, um, we, really, you have to also avoid that the whole uh, approach of the public involvement is taking also too much time, you, because you need to implement something so that they can see what is happening. And then an other tip, and that's it's, it's a lesson uh, which I see now in the Brussels region. The Brussels region is really also changing quickly, but there is a much stronger opposition than I uh, felt in Leuven. And, and not, not stronger, but a more aggressive opposition about uh, if about car uh, believers and car owners. So there is more a more polarized discussion, which is now in a very, um, yeah, the difficult uh, situation. But um, a lesson but which I have there, and I really, I can't compare it also to Leuven, uh, every city is other, but they, had made a traffic circulation plan where in the impression of a lot of people, you take something from them. And they have implemented too much uh, low quality, temporarily um, street furniture uh, things that, that don't have the, the, the impression that you get something in return. So we didn't do a complete makeover of the public domain in Leuven, but on different strategic points, we did it. So you really have to, to find a balance between the technical traffic circulation issues and upgrading the public domain in, in a manner that it is in, in different phases, but that the people see something that is really positive for them. And, I know I, I don't have the the, 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 the black-white answer to your question, but um, you really have to explain why you do it and, how, and what will they get into return. 
uh, that's my lesson uh, that I learned now. Uh, Okay, uh, thank, thank you. you, Tim Pedro. You would like to mention something. Yeah, no, uh, uh, sorry, yeah. just before you start, I would like to ask our participants to uh, to show their faces so that we have a group photo. Uh, Pedro, please. Yes, um, yes, I would like to add the following to to what Tim said. So I, I mean, I also have this local um, experience of working on projects that were you know bringing changes to to the city and uh, ask you know answering goran i would say the following you know number one work upstream as much as you can to avoid confrontation you know the the great chinese, the the great chinese uh, strategist uh, sun tzu you know in the art of war the art of war is not about how to fight is actually how to win with the little fighting as possible and he said something that for me i mean kind of guided me for a long time which was the best victory is when the battle is won even before it started. So I'm not saying that if there's opposition, something something went wrong. That's not what I'm saying. But you know, try to avoid confrontation as much as possible. And it's all that's why it's very important to talk about the vision, the future, uh, rather than you know come up with the measures first. The other point is that the more we judge. Uh, you know, people are against this. You know, the more our tendency is to judge them, the more we judge, the less we understand. And the less we understand, the less we're able to change their views or to influence them. Um, and so it's important to understand the constraints and the incentives that make them feel that way. There are a lot of people that have become car dependent. Um, it's not to say, okay, so you know, go on being car dependent, but it's to also to understand that. Um, that's something that we have to deal with. I think Tim quite, you know, kind of prevented uh, Tim to show that love is about providing people with alternatives. Um, and that's uh, very important. Um, the third point is that um, avoid treating the opposers as a group. You know, they, the people who are against, um, avoid the car people or whatever. Because what social psychology shows is that when people form groups, they tend to stick to the group. They tend to polarize their opinions. And they tend to, how would I say, feel the obligation to remain connected to the group. Um, and so avoid, you know, instead of the people who are with cars, no, the residents, some of the residents, uh, this resident, that resident, they're still residents. They're still users. They're, they still have family, you know, the... Um, so avoid isolating them as a group. It's more practical to describe them, but it's a, a, a real uh, mistake. Number four, remember that innovation is a social process. Any change is about, you know, bringing change, you know, changing the way mobility works in your city. It's innovation, the way we behave, the, the, the new values we adopt, the new behaviors we adopt, et cetera, et cetera. And so it's very important to use the social mechanism here. And we all, a big problem is that we, we give too much attention to the minority that is against, and we fail to um, activate, to give the voice to the majority who is in favor. And of course, the people who, have some, who feel they have something to lose will always have the all the incentives to be more active and more vocal and speak louder because they have something to lose. The people who have something to win, you know, I'm fine. Why will I move? So it's very important to find a way to make them visible, to make their voices heard, or to make it known that the majority is in favor. And finally, uh, just a, a final comment on a very important thing that Tim mentioned, which is, I mean, the way this connects with the political cycle, you know, Political officials, they come on, they, they have four year terms, they come in office. Usually, what I've seen over and over and over again is, you know, the first year they kind of, oh, well, we're, we're, which planet is this? The second year is, okay, maybe we should define some priorities. In the third year, they're basically panicking and trying to get something done before the next elections. And that's a big problem. And the way to fix this is not to pray for better politicians, you know. Sometimes you're lucky, like Tim, to find a great politician, you know, and that's great, but that's not the majority of the cases. 
it just what I want to highlight here is the real importance of the work of the technical professionals. So strategists like Tim and architects and landscape architects and transport planners, they are the ones who have to come up with the plans, with the ideas. Of course, political will and political support, you know, make a huge difference. But the point is that they are the professionals are the ones who have to often crossing the desert have to come up with viable ideas and approaches that when a new politician comes in, he or she may want to, because the politicians will be looking, they won't be looking for dreams. They will be looking for things that they can get done within the four years. And so it's who is going to develop that? The professionals, not the politicians. Um, and so it's critical for the professionals. I mean, I, I developed and implemented a pedestrian accessibility strategy in Lisbon. The key work on the strategy was done. I mean, I benefited a lot from the political support of a very committed uh, deputy mayor. But the point is, the large part of the work on this plan was done, was done on the two terms before he came into office. It was ready for him to pick and say, this is my priority, because it was ready. I mean, it doesn't have to be ready. The point is the ideas, we have to develop them, not just wait for the charming charm prince to come in a horse and save us from, you know, we the professionals have to stand up and like Gandhi, you know, be the change you want to see in the world. That's it. Thank you very much, Pedro. Uh, Stefan, would you like to add uh, something at the end? Unfortunately, Mateusz had to leave to collect her do his daughter. So uh, it's up to you if you would like to send some message. Well, and, uh, very, very shortly, thank you for, for this uh, excellent, uh, interesting debate. And I, I, I mean, we started with the big picture and we come down to the, the, the end where, where the people on the ground are going to find ways uh, of, of um, implementing a new transport system. And um, I mean, the discussion that there are always people who are against um, uh, transitions, it just shows what we started with. We have to all the time think about this that we 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 give not only sticks but also carrots in the transition because there are after all uh, in the end very good uh good prospects and everyone most at least i uh, think that this transition is really necessary but but uh we have to to uh to, to avoid uh, things that that uh, only gets uh, opposition without really uh, moving things forward. So thank you very much for for this. Uh, thank you very much to you, Stefan. Uh, I think uh, with this we can conclude uh, the uh, this webinar. Except uh, uh, Timer Pedro would like final sentence uh, but okay uh, thank you very much uh, for me personally it was very interested and as uh, Stefan you mentioned we started from the broader perspective and went to the local level and that that, that was kind of uh, idea and uh, hope that uh, soon we shall continue with uh, uh, our webinars but also a meeting in person that's uh, a, a different quality when we met in uh, meet in person, but sometimes uh, we can use these uh, uh, new possibilities that uh, we have. So thank you once more to all our speakers and also participants. And uh, uh, the as uh, you know, we recorded it and we shall put all the presentations and recording to the website. Uh, have a nice afternoon and uh, see you soon, hope, in virtual or in the real world. Bye. Thank you very much.